let me welcome you all joining from different parts of the world. I am Ashutosh Varshne, uh, director of the Saxena Center for Contemporary South Asia here at Brown University. And uh, it's a great, great pleasure for us at the center to sponsor this book Adda. Those not from South Asia, um, the Adda essentially uh, signifies a space for collective deliberation. <clears throat> Uh, the book we are discussing today was completed on a fellowship awarded to Gopal Gandhi, Gopal Krishna Gandhi, in the spring of 2020 by our center. And he uh, did uh, the, the finishing work here, and his co-author, Tridip Surut, um, collaborated from India. The title of the book is Scorching Love. Letters from M.K. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi to his son Devdas, published by Oxford University Press earlier this year. Devdas was the youngest of Gandhi's four sons and an editor of the Hindustan Times. He was born in South Africa in 1900 and he died in 1957 um, in Delhi. <clears throat> The title, Scorching Love, is not drawn from Gandhi's letters to Devdas. Instead, it is from a letter Gandhi wrote to his nephew, Jamna Das, on 20th February, 1914. But the love expressed in Gandhi's letters to Devdas has a scorching quality. And the authors will perhaps explain exactly how. Um, the book has 304 letters from Gandhi to, to Devdas. Uh, the authors didn't have access to Devdas's letters. So they infer Devdas's positions from what Gandhi said about um, what Devdas wrote. Um, of the 304 letters, 113 have already been published in the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. And 289, a very large proportion, has not been seen and analyzed thus far. And perhaps it's fair to say, though I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, that Gopal Gandhi had access to these papers. He's Devdas's son, <clears throat> Gandhi's grandson. And so we are, we will discuss today many uh, things that were not known. Um, and these letters uh, were written between March 1914, when Gandhi was 45 and Devdas 14, and January 14, 1948, when Gandhi was 79 and his son 48. 16 days after the last letter, on January 30th, 1948, Gandhi was assassinated by Nathuram Godse in Delhi. <clears throat> Let me say something about why these letters are important. <laughs> of all his sons, Gandhi's letters to Devdas constitute, to quote the authors, the shared vein of political reflection, of consultation on public affairs, and of the sharing of views on what is commonly called men and matters. Unquote. The shared vein of political reflection, of consultation on public matters, of the sharing of views on what is commonly called men and matters. So it's not simply that these letters are not simply about their family life or their life as father and son, but also about the larger public affairs. Um, I will, the, the authors will speak to us for about 30 minutes, and then I will turn to the two commentators, Uday Mehta first, and then Fazal Devji, um, who will speak for 12 minutes each, and then we'll open up for a Q&A. But uh, the preferred mode is that you send us your questions via text, and I will pick uh, the questions as moderator. Um, and and uh, present them to the authors or the commentators. 
Um, Gopal uh, is joining us from Bangalore. Tridip is joining us from Ahmedabad. Fazal is joining us from, from Oxford. And, uh, um, and Uday from next door, New York. Um, so let's start. Uh, welcome, Gopal and Tridip. The next 30 minutes are yours. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Ashutosh. With uh, Tridip's permission, I will initiate the conversation from the perspective of the co-editors. Gandhi and letter writing are inextricably mixed together. One of the earliest and most dramatic descriptions by Gandhi in his autobiography is about a letter that he wrote to his father, a letter of atonement, about what he perceived was an act of stealing. It was something quite different, but that is how Gandhi looked at it. And he says he wrote this letter of atonement, apology, and self-excoriation and gave it to his father who was very ill. First letter reference. He was in his very early teens at the time. But letters have been very central to his life. I've often wondered why he wrote so many letters. He even wrote letters to people who were in the same, same vicinity. <laughs> Did he just love writing? Did he love that mode of writing? Did he want to go and record? One doesn't know. Perhaps it was something like a mix of all these. But write letters he did. The collected works of Mahatma Gandhi is principally letters that he wrote. Some <clears throat> seemingly trivial, almost seemingly unnecessary and some supremely important and both kinds written on the same day. Many of the letters that are part of this book uh, letters to his son Dev Das were written from prison. In prison, Gandhi wrote prodigiously which is both a reflection of his interest in letter writing, his almost addiction to letter writing and also reflection of British policy because I am fairly certain that in allowing letters to be written to and received in prison for Gandhi's reading to Gandhi and letters being sent out by Gandhi from prison gave the British Raj a certain entree into Gandhi's thinking. They were protocol coda. He should not write about political matters. But in any case, I think the Raj must have been very keen to know what the man is thinking. And so the giving of letter writing stationary opportunity to write, and every letter was read as it left, served a certain purpose for the Raj. But that is only an incidental aspect of his letter writing. Every letter that he wrote was intended by him to be read by others. Except when he, when he said, tear up this letter after you read it. But mostly, he assumed that others would read this letter that he was writing. And very often, he said very specifically, especially to his son, Devdas, after you've read this, send it to your brothers. Send it to so-and-so. It will save me the 
task of writing another letter directly. And so letters. There was something else about his letter writing to his sons which bears notice. That is that they were substitutes to what can be called a parental guiding of the son into an educational path. They had a pedagogic role. He was acutely conscious of the fact that he did not put his sons through formal education. He himself had, of course, gone through school, matriculation, and then passed the London matriculation, become a barrister. But he did not put any of his sons through school or college. And this was something which his eldest son, Harilal, a remarkable man, pointed out to him very regularly and very sharply. And it was sort of rankling in the father. And so letter writing was also a kind of process of educating his sons. The very first letter that Ashutosh mentioned talks about your handwriting, Devdas, <laughs> leaves much to be desired. Yeah. It's curious. I think Uday has got this point. That letter is being written at a time when Devdas's mother, the letter writer's wife, Kasturba, is critically ill. But what is the emphasis? Your mother is very ill. She may not survive. That is how life is. You should be prepared for bad news. But Devdas, your handwriting also must improve. <laughs> now, this is the touch of the lighted but just extinguished matchstick on the fingertip of the letter writer. It scorches. <laughs> the letters written to my father, Devdas, were preserved by him meticulously. I don't know how these letters got preserved from very early because I think the sons, all of them, all of them received letters in different uh, frequencies, extremely carefully preserved. Devdas kept them in files which he had made, handcrafted files using calendar paper, kept them all in a trunk, and there is no doubt that Devdas intended to edit, publish them, translate them from the absolutely distinctive Gujarati they were written in for a future readership. But as Ashutosh said, uh, at age 57, he died very, very suddenly. And this work remained unfulfilled. This trunk of letters from father to son just remained calling out for attention. But the urgent always takes precedence over the important. And his sons went through school, the sons, sons, went through school, went through college, went through romances, went through marriages, letters remained in the trunk. But then the time came when they just said, we can't wait anymore, we are crumbling. Pridit offered to take a look at them, translate them, and hand to hand, from trunk to file to suitcase, luggage on airways, back the same way they were translated. They were also at the same time looked after very well. And strangely, this is an aside, and I have only three minutes more. Strangely, 
all these decades, not one letter suffered infestation. <laughs> no miracle is being talked about. Of course not. Gandhi would have laughed at him. It just so happens, one of those things, pristine condition. And there they are. All the 304 of them, now in the shape of a book, scorching, but scorching in their love. The last letter has been written down for him by Manu, Manu Gandhi, but signed in the same way as the first. Bapu na like Bapu's blessings. He has signed the letter himself, but it's been dictated to Manu who has written it. And it is again scorching. It is about Devdas is telling his father, you shouldn't fast. This is the last fast. Gandhi's last fast. What was to be his last fast? Last fast. To stem communal violence in the capital city of India and thereby in a larger area. Devdas has said, you will serve India much more by living than by dying. But Gandhi says, this is son's sentiment speaking. He knows what he is doing. Gandhi's fasts, like his letters, were his speciality. He knew the technology of fasting, the anatomy of a fast, the philosophy of a fast, the politics of a fast, the redemption of a fast. And this particular fast was not time lined. He would have stopped, he said, only when there is peace. So Devdas has said, no, Bapu, don't. And Bapu says, sorry, Devdas, but you are wrong. I'm fasting. I fast when I must. And he writes the last sentence to say, and read this letter again and again. Read it, please. Thank you. Um, so Thank can, you, can, you can you can you pause for just a minute? I sure. gave an intellectual overview. I should also give a professional uh, uh, introduction. Gopal Gandhi, uh, grandson of Gandhi, is also a professor of history and politics at Ashoka University, and by training, an administrator. And some notable assignments have in, or roles have included Governor of West Bengal, High Commissioner to South Africa during President Nelson Mandela's leadership, and Secretary to the President of India, and many publications, including a novel, a play, a translation into Hindustani of Vikram Seth's novel, A Suitable Boy, a frank friendship, Gandhi and Bengal, My Dear Bapu, correspondence between Siraj Gopalachari and Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, and Tridib Surud is a professor at CEPT University in Ahmedabad. Um, he has extensively worked on the life and thoughts of Mahatma Gandhi. He served as director and chief editor of Sabarmati Ashram Preservation Memorial Trust, a very unique uh, position and a unique entry into Gandhi's uh, life you can have at Sabarmati Ashram. And, um, um, and his prizes include the Katha Award in 1999 and Sahit Academy Translation Prize in 2009 for, uh, for, for, uh, for Harilal Gandhi, the book he translated, Harilal Gandhi, A Life, and Harilal was the oldest son of Mahatma Gandhi. Through them. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it was um, sometime in 2013 that I was in Chennai having coffee with Gopal Sahib and he says come um, to my study and then he showed me these 27 files and pulled out one and it had the letters arranged chronologically but it was not just the letters there was a complete archive um, which was there 
So over and above the letters, these files contained much more, uh, something that this book is beyond the scope of this book, but they contain letters from all the principal ashramites to, to Devdas Gandhi, Mahadev, um, uh, you know, very close, Pyare Lal, almost a brother-like friendship. So there is much more to what Devdas Gandhi papers, as, as we understand them now, have. Uh, when, when they are studied, when they are read, translated, uh, they will provide a very unique insight into the working of the ashram community. Because what it provides us is the kind of insight in the ashram community which, which we've not had through any other set of papers. So I do hope that at some point um, someone will look at those papers um, going beyond what, what can be. So the, the importance of the papers uh, really goes beyond the unpublished material that we've been able to put together in this particular volume. Uh, those papers also contain something else, and those papers contain um, letters of other family members. So it they also provide, and I think what this book intends to do is to really look at the possibility of writing a biography of Gandhi as a, as a householder, as a grihast. Uh, and, and, and to complete that story, it is necessary to look at what the brothers wrote to each other um, uh, without the, the intercession of the parents. Uh, and, and the Devdas Gandhi papers, I think, of the papers that I've seen in the family domain really provide that kind of material. So the importance of what um, Devdas Gandhi preserved, collected, filed, uh, I think went beyond his desire to write only uh, the life of his father or his life with his father, there was a possibility of a much more that to, to be done. Um, so that's that's that. Um, for me, um, this was an act of grace and there's nothing, no other word to, to, no other sense in which to describe this. As a translator, I had never imagined that one would work on unpublished material written by Gandhi. And, and um, um, you, you only hope, hope for that, but you know that 100 volumes have been done, no more letters are to, to emerge in any substantial um, collection. Uh, and when this, um, when this came to me, um, and that, that has been the feeling with me from day one. What, you know, I thought that I, I knew how to write a book. Um, and I knew how to translate. Uh, and I knew how to work on, on letters. Uh, but what um, Gopal Sahib did uh, to me was something quite amazing. And I think my education and apprenticeship in that way to the archive and to what scholastic engagement with an archive could mean, um, I think got completed in this process. He told me um, that um, we will not make copies of the letters. There will be no electronic copies made. Uh, so between 2013 and 2017, very slowly, um, um, I copied out the entire archive in notebooks. Um, and I think that kind of understanding of what that act of writing meant, what um, staying with each word, each line meant, um, enriched me beyond measure. And, and uh, what it did for me as a translator, uh, I understand only now when I look at the translation, because um, the translation that, uh, uh, the, the, the new translation that we provide and the translation of the collected works, which has been done by great masters, um, we've been able to come very close to, uh, to the style, the cadence of the collected works. And um, Gopal Sahib didn't tell me um, that this is what it will do to you, but that actually what uh, that learning uh, was. The other thing that we, um, you know, for somebody like me, uh, it, it, it did was um, um, all let letters are, are about other people, men and matters. And, and it's the other people, um, I think uh, Gopal Sahib taught me how to write biographical notes. Uh, you know, um, we went 
all over the world asking for minor details of all the characters who uh, who are there but it's really through the large amount of biographical notes that this uh, volume has that the aspect that he mentioned of other people comes alive in in this so it's been a process um, of great learning for me um, um, not only great learning uh, but also um, um, one felt um, very fortunate that I um, worked on um, a biography of Harilal and now what comes closest to a biography of Devdas. Uh, it is, we know that it's not a biography, but it, it is something which is in lieu of a biography. It provides enough material for one aspect of his um, very rich life uh, for a future biographer. So one, uh, I am very, very deeply grateful to Gopal Bhai um, for, for, for allowing me to do this. Uh, the other thing that um, this does is, I think the importance really here is that, uh, and then it said in the book that Gandhi is obsessive householder. And that's not an image that many biographers or historians have of him. Uh, here, is, here is one consistent example of how deeply, there is only one Gujarati phrase, uh, uh, which is called Chanchupat, which is to really put your beak into the affairs of others. He's constantly putting his beak into the affairs of everyone around him, um, you know, sometimes with great affection, sometimes uh, with advice, with admonition, but he is constantly concerned about the fate, um, the well-being of each member of this very large household but at the same time it's a household consisting of ba four sons and and three daughters in law and that's something that this book um, does which i think um, is an aspect that many biographers and historians have tended to overlook except in 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 a way of criticism to say that he was um ill-equipped to be a father or disinterested father or a father who was overbearing. But the kind of everyday concern that comes through uh, in these letters and the way they've been placed together uh, is, is, I think, very instructive. Uh, I think there is something very special about his relationship to, to Devdas. And for me, it, is, it comes through in the fact that during the 1924 fast in Delhi, there is a postcard that's written to Devdas every day. Uh, I don't think there was anybody else, either in his political associates, his ashram community members, or in the family domain, who received a daily postcard written in Gandhi's own hand. So, you know, um, those, those 24 postcards are very, very, very precious. Um, it actually is a daily report of what Gopal Sahib said about the technology of fasting, the anatomy of fasting, the, uh, the act of being closer to God is what he's attempting to do here. And that's, that's very special about that relationship. Um, um, and and um, I think we need to recognize the fact that here is somebody um, who is somebody constantly challenging Gandhi, uh, both in the personal domain and also in the in the in the public domain we know that during the 1932 fast for example it is he and rajaji who go and argue against the fallacy of the act of fasting we know that again rajaji and in some ways devdas also argue against the calcutta fast and here mm. is devdas again arguing against the delhi fast and i don't think it's only a deep uh, and abiding affection for the father or the concern that the father will probably not survive the fast, but there is, uh, he thinks of himself capable, worthy of posing a spiritual question and not just a political question to Gandhi. And in that sense, uh, Devdas's relationship to his father is very different from the other sons. Um, Harilal very tragically tries to question it, uh, does not have, uh, he has a language which Gandhi does not understand. In this instance, they both share a language uh, of both affection and agony. And I think that makes this relationship very special. Uh, so thank you very much. 
uh, all of you and thank you Gopal Sahib uh, for for doing this together thank you very much thank you thank you to the um uh the first comment will first commentator is Uday Singh Mehta he's been a valuable uh, partner for our center he's visited us he's participated in um, several of our events um, um, he is a distinguished professor of political science at the graduate school of city university of new york um, and before that he taught uh, at princeton cornell mit where i met him first university of chicago university of pennsylvania university of hull in england and amherst college uh, in western massachusetts he's the author of the anxiety of freedom uh, imagination and individuality in the political thought of John Locke and my one of my top favorites uh, something that I, a book that I learned so much from liberalism empire that I've used in my class for something like uh, what 20 years now it was published in 2000 liberalism and empire and especially his treatment of John Stuart Mill and Edmund Burke um uh, Liberalism and Empire was awarded the J. David Greenstone Prize for the best book in political theory by the American Political Science Association in 2002. And he has a forthcoming book on Gandhi, A Different Vision, Gandhi's Critique of Political Rationality, on which he spoke uh, two years ago uh, at our center. Welcome back, uh, uh, Oday. You are mic is silent today. Uh, thank you, yeah. uh, Ashutosh and Brown, and of course, um, Gopal Bhai and Tradeep. Uh, I've admired all of you uh, in different ways, um, and thank you for putting together this incredibly important volume. Um, uh, actually, I, I have never read anything like it. Uh, I've read many, many books on Gandhi. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm, I was telling somebody the other day, uh, uh, what are you doing? And I said, this is what I'm doing. Um, so uh, it's a privilege to be part of this. Uh, group of this Adda. Uh, 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 as uh, Ashutosh said, you know, uh, my training is as a political theorist. And uh, um, so th my comments uh, about this book will will uh, rep will capture that. Um, uh, the first thing I want to say is that this book or these letters um, exemplify many of the themes that uh, characterize Gandhi's life and works. Um, uh, so it's this, and one of the things that has always struck me about Gandhiji is that he combines the abstract and the minute. And many of these letters exemplify that. Um, uh, so th there are letters in which uh, He's talking, uh, uh, as Gopal Bhai said, um, the first letter uh, deals, and he comes back to this theme very often, uh, uh, what about your handwriting? When will that improve? Um, uh, and in that letter, he's also commiserating with him that your mother is about to die. Um, uh, and so uh, that's, a, that's this theme about death, and the minutiae of writing, you know, that Gandhiji often uh, combines. Um, the other thing is um, Socrates uh, was um, uh, uh, was thought of as the, a doctor of the soul, as was Jesus. Um, and this book made me realize that. What does it mean to minister to a polity 
an individual and the soul at the same time. And, and one of the things that runs through this um, book, uh, as it does in other things Gandhi's written, um, is the connection between physical health, spiritual health, and the health of the country. Uh, and you see this time and time again in these letters. Um, so um, uh, there are various points where he discusses, or in fact, many of these letters start with a query about his health, about Devdas's health. Are you well? Are you not well? Are you so, um, And uh, he often tells Devdas, don't worry about me. I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, um, and that, I take it, is uh, this uh, almost unique capacity Gandhiji has in, in talking in different registers and combining them. Uh, uh, and, you know, I think that's what makes Gandhiji, uh, among many other things, that makes Gandhiji such a special person. Uh, the other uh, theme that runs through these letters is um, uh, the importance of courage. Uh, and uh, there are various places in these letters where Gandhiji says, um, so and so is not afraid of dying. And that's what makes her special. She has the courage to die and to do it with her eyes open, to embrace death. Um, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I don't know who else says this. Um, um, I mean, uh, as a political theorist, one of the things that is the foundational premise of modern political theory is that you have to worry about dying. You have to avoid dying. Uh, uh, and Gandhi says, you have to embrace dying. You have to be fearless in the face of death. Uh, and uh, so I, I think of this as a kind of um, uh, philosophic anthropology. You go from the minute to the philosophical. And uh, and I, I think, I don't know of anybody who does this quite as well as Gandhi does. Um, uh, uh, the other thing uh, uh, is uh, there are various letters in which uh, Gandhi is asserting a certain point. Do this, don't do that, don't do this. But he also, typically, that assertion is done in the voice of humility. And that combining of assertiveness with humility is one of the things that I think characterizes Gandhiji's life as a general. It's particularly evident in these letters. Uh, so, uh, uh, so coming back to this theme of um, philosophic anthropology, uh, in a sense, for Gandhiji, everything is connected. The world is connected. The trivia of the world and the abstract of the world is connected. Uh, uh, and that connectiveness um, uh, is exemplified in these works, um, uh, in this work. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, so given this connectedness, if you're, if you're responsible for yourself, to be responsible for yourself, 
you have to in effect be responsible for the world uh, uh, so it is as it were uh, the opposite of that Dostoevskian uh, statement I am not my brother's keeper here Gandhi says I am my brother's keeper not only am I my, my brother's keeper, I'm the keeper of everyone else. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, I think he has a kind of a fascinatingly capacious conception of health. Um, many of these letters have to do with diet. Uh, he gives people guidance on what they should eat, how much they should eat, you know, what time you should eat. Um, and that's a kind of... Uh, so so we, we moderns or we contemporary people uh, would say uh, that's interfering with somebody else's business. Uh, you know, you, you don't tell somebody uh, what you eat, uh, uh, you know, unless you're a Jewish mother. Um, um, uh, uh, but here is Gandhi doing that. He's telling people how much you should eat. Or he's telling Devdas at various points, you should drink more milk. Uh, and uh, so that's a a, a conception of health um, that we just don't have. Um, uh, uh, so, so health for us is a private matter. Uh, and yet, uh, health for Gandhi is a capacious matter. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so those are some of the things uh, that I found interesting. Uh, I could say the whole volume is fascinating, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you there for these remarks. Our next commentator has also been an important part of our life here at Brown. He's visited us. He's spoken at our events. Uh, Fazul Devji is Professor of Indian History at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He uh, took his PhD from, in intellectual history from Chicago and was an elected junior fellow at Harvard Society of Fellows. And then via the Institute of Smiley Studies in London and the New School of Social Research in New York, he arrived at Oxford um, in 2009, where he's been ever since. And his most important publication for, for, for our purposes here in Gandhi is The Impossible Indian, Gandhi and the Temptation of Violence, published in 2012. Though I think Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a Political Idea, published in 2013, is also relevant. Uh, welcome back, uh, uh, Fazal. Thank you very much, Ashutosh. It really is a privilege to be here, um, uh, not least uh, because of the other members of this panel, including yourself, certainly Gopal Gandhi, Trilip Sood, and Uday Mehta, with whom I've been having conversations about Gandhi for well over a decade now, since we were both uh, teaching at Chicago uh, many years ago. Um, reading this manuscript, uh, this book rather, was uh, also a, a, a real privilege, um, not least because we don't really have anything like it. We have, of course, collections in the, uh, of Gandhi's uh, letters, and we have the collected works, uh, which are, as Gopal Gandhi mentions, full of letters. Uh, letters are the most prominent uh, part of the collected works. Yet here we have uh, a series of letters uh, by Gandhi to his son, interspersed with the most remarkable, I should say, to the credit of Tridh Surud and Gopal Gandhi, uh, summary uh, of Gandhi and Devdas Gandhi's life uh, at various periods during which these letters were written. So you have a kind of dialogue between the editor's um, recension, if you will, of Gandhi's life world 
and the letters themselves. It reminded me in some ways of Gandhi's own uh, reliance on the dialogue form, both in a number of his letters and his articles in Young India and Harijan, but also, of course, um, uh, very prominently in Hind Swaraj, conducted as a dialogue between an editor and a reader. Here we have two editors uh, and many readers, as it turns out, but the form is what I found very interesting. So what I'd like to do is to say something about three or four um, uh, aspects of uh, these letters. The first having to do with uh, its title, the title of the volume itself, Scorching Love, which I think is a wonderful title and speaks uh, so well of the nature of the relationship between uh, Gandhi and his son. Um, what is, of course, scorching about that love is it's the link it makes between intimacy on the one hand and sacrifice on the other. Again, one is reminded very strongly of Gandhiji's own interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita, the key text for him, and of the Gita's doctrine of uh, sacrifice in particular, uh, where he tells us in his commentary uh, that what Krishna advises Arjuna is that the first people to be sacrificed are those closest to oneself, i.e. Arjuna's own family, but sacrificed out of love. And it seems to me there's a, a very interesting relationship between, if you will, the classical form of sacrifice where you sacrifice yourself for another and this further form of the sacrificial impulse where your sacrifice of the other, that is to say those closest to yourself also counts as your sacrifice, your sacrifice for the other. So there's a kind of strangely, there's a transitive relationship between self-sacrifice and the sacrifice of the other, which come together in a single form, a sacrificial form. And you see this in the letters over and over again. Gopal Bhai mentions uh, in, his, in his talk uh, very early on, um, Gandhi's, uh, earliest letter, which is a sacrificial letter as well to his father, confessing a letter of atonement, confessing his apparent theft uh, and asking for forgiveness. Uh, as it turns out from Gandhi's autobiography, the father's forgiveness is manifested only in his tears and one can't tell what those tears signify. Uh, Gandhi benefits from them anyway, they are described as a blessing and the blessing indeed is the crucial word in all these letters uh, and not simply because they are signed off with Bapuna Ashirvad, uh, Gandhi, uh, the father's blessing, father's blessings. Because Ashirvad blessing is what every form of intimate sacrifice takes in these letters. And we have a number of remarkable instances uh, where Gandhi publicly in writing, uh, he publishes in his journal uh, an accusation that his own wife, Kastuma, has stolen, stolen money. She can't help herself for you know, uh, taking money uh, for her family, uh, whether it's 200 rupees saved uh, with much difficulty over a great period of, uh, period of time, or four rupees, and she's humiliated. But the way in which Gandhi uses that word humiliation, uh, but the way in which he exposes the supposed th theft of his own wife, again, uh, is done in the form of an ashivad, in the form of a blessing, and is done with the deepest kind of love. That letter, I thought, was quite extraordinary in this collection. And of course, in writing it, or in rather in the, the, uh, the, um, the publication that, uh, uh, that, that Gandhi uh, reveals to the world about his wife and the letter he writes about it to Devdas, uh, both those documents are full of reminiscences in so many ways, some clear, some half suppressed. Uh, Gandhi's own theft that Gopal Bhai has already mentioned, uh, the theft or the smuggling operation of Parsi Rustamji in South Africa, that Gandhi describes in Satyagraha in South Africa, uh, 
the impropriety, sexual impropriety of Chagan Lal Gandhi, and I think that was his name, uh, and widows in his ashram, uh, the theft or the sexual impropriety of his friend, Sheikh Mahtab, um, etc. All of these are echoed in these documents. Uh, there's another one from Kasturba, which deploys Ashirvad. Uh, and it's a wonderful letter that Kasturba writes to Lady Willingdon, which I gather uh, from Tridip's note is in draft form only in Devdas's archive. It was never sent to Lady Willingdon, um, thanking her uh, for the courtesy shown to her and allowing Kasturba to join Gandhi in prison. Uh, but it ends, it's beautifully written. So Gandhi could not have complained about his wife's handwriting. Uh, <laughs> it was clearer than Gandhi's own, in fact. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's signed off with the Ashirvad of Mrs. Gandhi. So Gandhi, <laughs> here Kasturba has actually taken on the character of her husband. Um, uh, so that's one set of issues. I also thought it was fascinating how Devdas Gandhi and his father engage through these letters, through many of them, in a kind of relationship of literary and epistolary criticism. Uh, you know, there is, uh, for instance, uh, the letter or two where uh, dealing with Upton Sinclair, the American novelist who has written a book on prohibition that Gandhi quite likes, and Devdas doesn't like it so well, he thinks uh, that Upton Sinclair, like American authors in general, he suggests is propagandistic and he much prefers Thomas Hardy. And Gandhi writes back saying, well, he doesn't really know Hardy, but he wouldn't complain about propagandistic uh, authorship because after all, Harriet Beecher Stowe and her book, of course, Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, Gandhi argues had a kind of aesthetic as well as political effect uh, that was unsurpassed, uh, despite or perhaps because it was propagandistic. And he seems to draw the aesthetic effect from the propaganda, uh, or rather the political effect of that book. Then there is also Dave Das's, if you will, literary criticism of Gandhi. Why did you write to H.G. Wells in this particular way? Uh, why did you write to the Viceroy in such and such a way? So that relationship I found quite uh, uh, fascinating, where they really are engaged in a dialogue about literary and epistolary matters, in addition to, of course, these matters also being political or moral ones. Um, and the third theme I want to touch upon um, uh, goes back to H.G. Wells, uh, the letter that Gandhi wrote to the famous British writer H.G. Wells, because H.G. Wells had written to Gandhi about what he called a charter of the rights of man. And Gandhi, as we know, uh, was very critical of the idea of rights. And his letter back to H.G. Wells, which Devdas is not so fond of, is not so fond of its style, of its what appears to be its peremptory tone rather than of its content. And what Gandhi writes back is the clearest statement, I had not seen this letter before, is the clearest statement I have come across of Gandhi's criticism of the idea of rights. Uh, because, of course, Gandhi says in this letter, well, it looks very nice when you come up with a chart of rights. I might have come up with a better chart of rights, but the point is not that. The point is, who will enforce these rights? Who will guarantee them? Once you ask yourself this question, you will find that you're back with the world of the tyrant and of the despot, because, of course, it is only power that can define and enforce and guarantee rights. And that is what makes the as it were, idea of rights, the liberal idea of rights, an unworkable one for Gandhi. And he says, uh, rights can only be owned by others, uh, though they might be described as inalienable, they are in fact the most alienable of things. Uh, what really belongs to all individuals and all moral beings is their duties. Uh, and he says, I realized very quickly when I started trying to exercise what I thought were my rights, especially, and he specifies this, my rights over my own wife, I realized that I had none or I could never enforce them. Uh, but it was only when I started thinking of my duties to people around me uh, that my rights came 
subsequently uh, as the unintended effect of me performing those duties. Uh, the letter, of course, I had been familiar with was to um, Julian Huxley, uh, who was uh, gathering views on, on the document that become, became the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights. And there too, of Gandhi, there too, of course, Gandhi specifies that he prefers duties over rights. Duties are the only things that can be owned. And the chief duty, going back to what Uday was just saying, is the duty to die. It is the ultimate form of sacrifice. The chief right, of course, is always the right to life. And life for Gandhi uh, and the privileging of life is not only immoral in its own, uh, uh, in its own right, but uh, uh, it is the kind of uh, factor that makes tyranny and despotism what it is, because it is the promise of life and the protection of life that gives the tyrant uh, his power. Um, now, I want to uh, end uh, by saying something about a very interesting set of contradictions that also comes through in these letters. Uh, um, a single contradiction, I should correct myself, between, on the one hand, Gandhi's focus, almost overwhelming and obsessive focus on plurality and difference and their importance, on the one hand, and uh, what appears to be a curious blindness uh, to their consequences on the other. So I'm referring here to uh, the issues of intermarriage on the one hand, and they are discussed by the editors as well as in the letters. On the one hand, Manilal Gandhi wants to marry Fatima Gul and a Muslim girl and Gandhi is against it. On the other hand, of course, Dev Das Gandhi marries outside his caste uh, and uh, Gandhi has to persuade Rajji about this. There is also a, a, an intermarriage not related in this volume where Vijay Lakshmi Pandit also wants to marry a Muslim. And, and the editors, I think, do a wonderful job in, in making the point that Gandhi's concern is not so much with intermarriage, it's with the importance of maintaining a difference plurality uh, um, uh, and, if you will, diversity. And that these ideas of intermarriage in the political situations they were broached had the possibility of destroying uh, respect for plurality and difference. This issue, of course, comes out also uh, when he writes about interdining and changes of occupation uh, where caste is concerned, as also conversion from one religion to the other. So the contradiction that I find fascinating here uh, is that on the one hand, Gandhi, of course, is, is he urges people like Mirabai not to convert to Hinduism. He sees Haridal's multiple conversions to Islam, possibly to Christianity un, uh, unfulfilled, then to the Arya Samaj, as bringing shame upon all the communities into which he converted. Uh, um, Khaja uh, Hassan Nizami's book, Krishna Charitra, in Urdu, uh, an account of Krishna Gandhi doesn't like, but Devdas likes. And I suspect he doesn't like it so much because he thinks that he's really against what come to be the regular nationalist, uh, but also Hindu nationalist ideas of assimilation and integration as a form of uh, the erasure of difference. Uh, but how do you exercise those two things together? On the one hand, the respect for difference and plurality, and on the other, uh, uh, the carrying of that respect to such a degree as to uh, be against uh, the, if you will, the vicarious occupation of another's identity or religious conversion. Uh, so let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Fadil. Um, I see Prerna wants to ask a question, but before I invite Prerna, to, uh, uh, to all, all those on this Zoom call, um, you can, uh, we announced that uh, you could send a text through the chat function and uh, we will pick some questions, uh, but 
uh, but if Prerna wants to speak, uh, she, uh, I, I think she does. So let's, and she's been allowed by by Grace to speak also. So let's 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 compromise on that rule and let's ask Prerna what she wants to speak. Well, I was actually just clapping. That was my hand gesture. Um, okay. But uh, but I'm happy for it to be mistaken for a question because uh, okay. I just want to start by expressing uh, my gratitude to all of you for joining us today and for this amazing uh, you know discussion. I look forward to reading the book. And the question that I had actually was more of a reflection, and in some ways it comes out as a product of the child of the '90s. And and I you know when we were in school, we were of course assigned letters from a father to a daughter, which was Nehru's letters to Indira Gandhi. And the Central Book Trust in Delhi made this book uh, you know, publicly available, commonly available, and we read it. And so part of me, you know, and the interesting thing, and you know, I haven't had a chance, unfortunately, to meet many of you in person, but I've read your work and, and really learned so much from it. So the question, so I'm writing a book, which in some ways is about public health. And so Professor Mehta's comments about the link between the health of the individual and the body politic, but also Faisal's uh, point about this rights and duties, which I find endlessly fascinating. Um, in, so I'm trying to develop an idea of the moral authority of the state to explain public health outcomes. And so to me, that idea of duty and emphasizing duty and seeing this link between individual health and the health of the body politic are actually intimately related. But the question that I really just had was in this, so how would we, if we had to place this book a little away from Gandhi and more into this genre of a political figure of kind of father of our nation in some ways, writing to an offspring. And we know that Nehru does that too. And in some ways, Letters from a Father to a Daughter was such a was such a touchstone for so many of us who grew up is I'm just wondering in what ways does a communication between Nehru with his one daughter who then of course goes on to play and, and the family continues to play such an important role in post-colonial Indian politics versus Nehru's uh, versus Gandhi's much more intimate only now brought to light communication with one of, one of many sons, none of whom goes to play the same role. Like, is there something that we can see between this correspondence between Nehru and Indira and Gandhi and, and his sons that, that could be interesting? And so that was a reflection, but um, I, was, I was clapping. Um, that was my clap hand icon. But thank you for this, Ashu. Yeah. yeah. Would you like to comment, uh, Gopal um, or Tridev or, or Uday or the... Uh, the comparison that Prerna is drawing between Nehru's letters to his daughter and Gandhi's letters to his uh, youngest son uh, examined in this uh, book. Any any reflections on that? Any, any, any one of you? But I'll just make a very quick comment uh, on this. Uh, I had not thought of the parallelism, but I'm very grateful to Prerna for uh, flagging it. Both fathers wrote, I think, the letters to the offspring as a compensation for the lack of regular, if not daily, conversations. Gandhi and Nehru in jail were mortified by the fact that they were not there to oversee the upbringing of the child. And so there was an element of compensation, of also self-mollification. I'm doing this, which I should be doing more directly, but at least this. So there was that similarity. Is there a difference? I think the differences are the differences of, of the two individuals, the differences between them, the, the difference between them, the two persons, the two, two human beings, very, very different persons. And that comes through the letters. There is nothing of the admonitory tone that you see in Gandhi's letters to his sons, in Nehru's letters to his daughter. Nothing of that. So yes, there is a similarity. And of course, 
the personalities of the two make the two lit two sets of letters very different. Can I probe this a little further? Uh, we know that uh, um, um, that Nehru that Indira married a Parsi. Uh, she married outside religion. Um, and uh, at least um, what I've read is, is that um, Nehru was not very comfortable with it. So ultimately, of course, Indira, uh, the daughter prevailed. And, uh, uh, but is there, is there a comparison to be made here um, between the inter-religious marriage of, is it the second son, Tradip, or third? Uh, no, not the intercaste marriage of Devdas, but the second or the third son married a Muslim, right? No, there was there was um, there was oh. a desire to do so. Yeah, there was a desire to do so. Okay, is there a What is Gandhi saying about that, and what is Nehru saying about Indira's proposed marriage to to Firoz? Is no, there a, is there something to be Gandhi, said about that? What Gandhi says to Firoz is far more interesting. Because yeah. he is somebody who rises to the defense of Firoz Gandhi publicly, uh, uh -huh. uh, because there was uh, uh, even at that point uh, um, a certain disapproval, public disapproval of this this person uh, and the fact uh -huh. that he uh, that uh, Indira Nehru should actually wish to marry uh, both outside religion and to a Parsi, uh, and 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 Gandhi wrote uh, a very 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 touching. Um, public letter admonishing mm -hmm. people about their stand on on Firoz, and that's something which is uh, uh, which is mentioned in this collection. Um, uh, mm. I, see. Uh, I think um, um, the way Gandhi um, responds to um, Devdas Gandhi and Lakshmi's attraction for each other is far more. Um, it's far less severe. That's one. Uh, it's 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 very sensitive, uh, uh, given what uh, the differences were, both in terms of age, uh, the relationship that Rajaji and um, and 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 Gandhi had, um, and um, she's actually taken on a tour of Sri Lanka, uh, isn't this up? Um, um, and and they, they travel together with Baba and Bapu get acquainted with Lakshmi uh, um, and, and, and that relationship then alters. Um, so there is, I think, between um, Gandhi's response in the case of Manilal and Gandhi's response one to um, Devdash and Lakshmi's uh, attraction and love for each other and Indira's desire to marry Firoz, there is a clear change uh, that happens. I have a question. I have two actually. Uh, whoever wishes to to respond, one is um, um, the rather interesting claim that his correspondence with his youngest son is not only about family matters or what he's eating and what he's not eating or his why he's not so why why can't he be regular about his eating habits you know about meals. Uh, but also about uh, matters of public significance. Um, this particular, the latter, uh, discussion about matters of public significance, this is not um, the mode of the epistolary mode vis-a-vis -vis the other three sons. Is right? Is that right? Uh, that's, that's why that has been pointed out. And uh, the, the relationship with the oldest son, Hari Lal, is especially charged and and difficult um so so why is that so is the first question uh, that i have um why is this relationship with the youngest son also about public affairs and matters of historical significance and not with the other three um the second is uh, the the never dying question about uh, brahmacharya experiments what did what did what did do we have any evidence of what the youngest son who was engaged in with the, with his father 
engaged in, in a conversation with father about virtually everything, so many things, telling him that he's the reason, he's the reason, he, he, he's the reason that, that uh, I'm not sure what's going on here, that he's the reason that the conversation with the Viceroy is failing, um, etc. cetera. Um, um, does, does the son say something about Brahmacharya experiment? So the two questions, anyone? Well, uh, Ridip, may I respond to that very quickly? You may complement what I'm saying. Um, it is not as if Gandhi's letters to, uh, to his other sons were bereft of uh, discussion on public matters, but they do predominate uh, the content of the letters to the youngest son. We must also await uh, with uh, interest and expectation a compilation of letters written by Gandhi to his second son, Manilai, which is underway and uh, being put together by uh, Manila's granddaughter, uh, the historian uh, Uma Mestri. That will show some more details of the correspondence between Gandhi and the second son, Manilal. But Devdas being editor of the Hindustan Times and also being very much in frequent contact with another father and son, Motilal and Jawaharlal, mm -hmm. and being particularly close to Rajaji mm -hmm. gave him a political profile which the other sons did not have. So this has given a political voltage to his letters to, to Devdas, which is not to say that there was a difference in the level of or nature of his bond with his sons of equal and parallel and coextensive importance are Gandhi's letters to his daughters in law. He kept a very steady correspondence with his sons' wives. And particularly in the case of Marina and Sushila, mm -hmm. to whom he wrote joint letters because they were both together in South Africa. There was correspondence on matters of South African India connection and also in the running of Phoenix and Indian opinion. On the second question, Ashutosh, uh, we have dealt with this uh, during the well documented uh, Brahmacharya element in the Noakali period. Yeah. 1946. Devdas, Devdas writes to his father very strongly and very critically. And Gandhi responds to it. And unfortunately, we don't have Devdas's letter. But we yeah. hear from Gandhi that among those who have criticized him very strongly and directly and frankly is Devdas. And he says, Devdas's letter to me is still ringing in my ears. So mm -hmm. among the letters and interventions from Devdas, which were of a critical nature of his father, the one on Brahmacharya is important. If I may like add, no. add a footnote to what uh, Gopal Bhai said. Um, you know, um, it's also evident from Manu's diaries of that period uh, that there is, um, there's been correspondence from Devdas to, to his father showing his disapproval. But I, I wish to draw, and I think what for me has been the great lesson, uh, both from this set of documents and, and Manu's diary, is that the disapproval actually of Gandhi's action in most instance uh, was transferred on to Manu. Um, it, almost every associate of Gandhi 
began to see Manu with deep suspicion. And there were three exceptions. Uh, and without those three, Manu would have been in a mental asylum. And those three were Devdas and Lakshmi Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, along with Indira. These four people who would have been equally uneasy, I believe, uh, with the nature of the experiment and that uh, Yagya, as Gandhi called it, did not, not only not transfer their unease, criticism onto the person of Manu, they showered Manu with love and affection. Uh, the fact that Manu survived um, the 20 years that she did after Gandhi's assassination in a relatively um, stable, although wasting away physically and probably very lonely otherwise, that these are the four people who held on to her. And that affection continued, I am told, after Gandhi's life. Uh, the fact that Manu wrote these diaries or wrote the nine volumes that she did is entirely because Panditji uh, asked her to in some ways. Uh, and, and in during her, these great travels across the country narrating Gandhi's life, uh, one constant source of affection remains the family of Devdas and Lakshmi Gandhi. Even in the diaries every day, the only person only person sometimes um, who treats her humanly is Lakshmi. Every evening at 9.30 she visits Bapu, but there is a special affection reserved for Manu. And I think that's important for me. Uh, and then for me, that has been a great le lesson. Uh, uh, and then that's why I think uh, in terms of human quality, these four stand out for me among all the associates including some of the most fascinating intellectual characters otherwise. Other questions? And there are some have. I don't want to be the only one asking. Um, all right, I don't see others yet, so let me ask one more. Um, we know, we learn a lot. Uh, I finished reading last night, the book. Um, we learn a lot about... Uh, um, a truly fascinating relationship between Devdas and, and his father. Um, there are some references to how Harilal, the oldest son, was also maintaining uh, contact with, uh, perhaps very warm, I don't know, I want to hear, with the, the youngest son. What we, this is slightly beyond a father and son, but not entirely from, between Devdas and, and, and MKG and, and Gandhi. But what do we know about how, and, and since, since you, you've translated a biography, what is the oldest son's view of um, how the relationship between the father and the youngest son is evolving? And why? How might one? Why? How might one understand the deeper underpinnings of that, if that's the right term? Ridit, this is for you. You know, I. What we know of of Harilal, uh, and I think it comes through in in um, is that. At every critical point in the family's life, collective life, um, this person who's otherwise untraceable um, reveals himself at critical moments, with the exception of one, which is Gandhi's assassination. Uh, he is there for, for every crisis. He is there when Ba is ill, dying. dying um, also, I think the great, um, you know, um, one, I think it was a, could have been a, only a great burden for Devdas that there is this young Rasik um, who is in his care at, at Jamia uh, and, and, and dies of typhus um, um, completely. Uh, and, and, and that would have destroyed uh, um, a young uncle, um, you know, himself only. Um, hardly 23, 24, uh, not yet 30, clearly. Um, and 
there is not a trace of anger uh, that Harilal shows at any point uh, about you know the lack of care or, or the lack of uh, I mean the father could have accused the brother of of all kinds of things so there is just tenderness that he has for his siblings um, and also of course uh, he knows it I mean he is also extremely literate so um, there is another instance uh, uh, along with Upton Sinclair there is another one who's written on drink is Zola uh, and 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 young Devdas actually carries the book apparently to to Harilal who's sitting and enjoying a drink and says um, you should be reading this and and he says I can write such books my lad and and, and I think that is that is that about about Harilal um, uh, but I think um, with all the all the anger that he had for the father uh, there was nothing but affection for the brothers and their families and a deep devotion to his mother mm -hmm. very clarifying any other thoughts Uday, Fazal? Uday, you're off. Okay. One thing I wanted to say in response to Prerna's question was that um, uh, the, 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 the occasion for uh, Pandaji's uh, letters to Indira um, are different. They are there to teach her history, to give her a sense of world history. Um, and uh, I just can't imagine uh, Gandhiji doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, so I mean... Uh, why, why would that be so there? Why would Gandhi not want to teach his children world history? Just because... Uh, uh, I mean, not in that form, not in that form, because that's not the kind of thing he valued. He didn't value uh, knowing when Mesopotamia, whatever happened in Mesopotamia, or when the Italians invaded uh, Ethiopia. Uh, that's not what he valued. Uh, and that's what not what he thought was relevant to being educated. Um, uh, so, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there are places where he says, uh, Gandhiji says, you know, uh, things like education is overrated. Uh, uh, I, I can't formal, imagine. Formal, formal education, formal education. Yeah, 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 yeah. Formal, children, education, yeah. formal education, formal yeah, education. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't imagine Gandhiji, uh, Pandiji saying that. Uh, you know, uh, Pezal, any thoughts about this or about any anything else that we have ha we've discussed for the last 20 minutes? Well, I, I thought, you know, one of the things that um, I also found remarkable about the letters is the, the way in which the father and the son come to certain kinds of decisions about the people they are meeting or corresponding with. And there are some mm -hmm. delightful and very um, profound almost uh, Ten portraits of figures, and the one that I was struck by was of Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. So mm -hmm. Devdas mm -hmm. writes, uh, you know, one of his Hindustan Times articles about the frontier Gandhi, you know, uh, coming to Delhi, and then of course he goes and stays with Gandhi, and Gandhi reads the article, which is a very, uh, it's actually a wonderfully, a wonderful piece by Devdas, mm -hmm. and then Gandhi, having lived in the company of Ghaffar Khan writes back to Devdas about his character. Now he writes a lot of other things. You know, he's very interested in how uh, the Patans uh, uh, maintain nonviolence uh, in a way that he thought was superior to other Indians. Fazal, we've lost you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, no. You, yeah. If, if you can go back 30 seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think, you know, so uh, Devdas has written this uh, wonderful piece in the Hindustan Times about the frontier Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi reads it, and then the, and then Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan goes to stay with Gandhi in his ashram. And having made his acquaintance in a more kind of uh, uh, detailed way, 
he writes back to Devdas about Ghaffar Khan, as it were both agreeing with some aspects of Devdas's article, but also adding his own uh, impressions. Mm -hmm. And he says about Abdul Ghaffar Khan that, you know, here is a man who is intellectually quite, I forget the exact word they uses, but something like stolid. You know, mm -hmm. he, uh, uh, he reaches decisions and he sticks to them, which is something that Gandhi normally likes. But in mm. this case, he says what results is that because Khan is intellectually stolid in this way, when he meets people, he can be quite credulous. So when he agrees with them or he likes them, he is fiercely loyal to them. And that's also a virtue, it's a good thing. But it means that he's actually preventing himself from thinking in a, a, a more expansive way about mm. men and matters to use that phrase. And so there's the, the most, it's a, it's a delightfully nuanced portrait in very few words. Mm. You know, Gandhi's famous laconic form of expression is a very spare and muscular prose mm. of a figure uh, that I found remarkably sophisticated. Uh, and there are several such things like this in which the father and the son as it correspond and come to some kind of decision about uh, characters in their respective lives. And it's something that shed for me more light upon Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan's character than uh, I've seen anywhere else. Uh, I see. It, it, so there, there are many instances of this kind. Uh, where, so you, what you end up getting from these letters is also a set of pen portraits, if you will, of different historical figures. And those alone are you know, worth looking at uh, quite apart from everything else. Final thoughts from Gopal and Trudip. I just say this, that uh, hearing your questions, uh, Ashutosh, and the responses that they have occasioned, and hearing Uday, Hazel, and Trudip's own ex expansions of some of our uh, attempts in the book has been for me an instruction and a delight. I must now go back to reading the same letters once more <laughs> in the light of what all of you have said. And Prerana, thank you for giving the juxtaposed example of another father's letters to a very different offspring. <laughs> very different offspring. Do I your final one thing. Yeah. Um, you yes. know, one thing is that it's. Uh, I have to say, I, I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, and uh, the thing is, I really wish as children we would have read this because the one thing, and I, I was really struck by Uday's comments, is that. I don't have happy memories of reading letters from a father to his daughter. Like it just came across and this is like my 10, 12 year old self speaking. But but I, you know, the funny thing is, I think there's something because a lot of the, the book is looking at Nehruvian India and kind of ideas of high modernity. And I'm teaching a class in which I'm reading and we're reading Jim Scott and juxtaposing that with kind of, um, you know, India and we're reading about Chandigarh. And so I do think there's something in which, and of course I'm a political scientist, so I'll bring it to that, but there's something about the way in which at least the book that I have read, Nehru writes to Indra and that kind of defines or is reflective of something about India's kind of early, at least post-colonial developmental trajectory, which I think feeds into where we are today in terms of Hindutva. And so, and I think that there's something about like, you know, Nehru would never be giving any kind of advice to Indra or anyone else about what to eat, drink more milk, diet, pulse. <laughs> and so infinitely, the, the, I think there's, you know, there's something to the juxtaposition of these letters that tells us about a counterfactual, what India could have been, what it was and where we are today. But, but you know, um, I was at the same institution okay. as Uday, but as a comparativist. So obviously that's where that's where I'll always return. Okay. So Deb, your final thought before we close? Um, just just deep, deep gratitude and, and thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I have started reading the book again because I have to we have we are trying to do the book in Gujarati now. Uh, okay. back to the uh, the like yeah. language of the letters. So uh, when so, says uh, he's doing the book in Gujarati again, he means yeah. that the introductory notes which are in english are going to be done by him into gujarati the letters of course 
are in Gujarati himself. And yeah. I <laughs> just occurs to me, Pradeep, that when you do the Gujarati edition, you may like to add a note on Gandhi's Gujarati literary style, which is <laughs> truly distinct. Yes. Well, uh, if anything, uh, the center is uh, most grateful to you all for discussing this very important book and a very important matter. Um, the, the fusion of the abstract and the minute to cite uh, uh, Uday's, Uday's wonderful summation um, and the pen portraits that uh, Fazal brought us attention to. Uh, thank you all for joining us, and perhaps uh, before long we'll have another such adda on some other book where all of us can engage again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.